The religious leaders believed that righteousness was all about the external, that righteousness was all about the uh, performance, was all about performing certain actions. But Jesus, Jesus said it's centered on the attitudes of the heart. And so last week we looked at how it all starts in the heart. And we looked at uh, murder and then we looked at adultery. We didn't quite make it to divorce. I want to make sure we have the time for divorce, especially in the culture that we're living, the society that we're living in. Uh, and so Matthew chapter 19, we will have much more time to look at the scriptures together. Uh, but I would just, uh, I would say this before we move to verse 33, uh, as Jesus shares on divorce in verse 31 and verse 32, he's referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And again, last week, it all starts in the heart, how sin comes from the attitudes of the heart, how anger is murder in the heart, how lust is adultery in the heart. We see that in verse 31, a written notice of divorce that Moses insisted on a written notice of divorce. And the purpose of that was that angry passions might have time to cool. Uh, and that the separation might be performed with deliberation and legal formality. And, and that the requirement of a writing was to a certain degree a check upon an evil habit. To make sure that there was this process that the two were moving forward. It wasn't just because the husband was displeased about uh, this silly thing, whatever it might be. But that there was a process and then that there was a time. And so we're going to... Spend much more time on this subject. There's uh, much before us with verses 33 through the end of the chapter. These laws 4, 5, and 6 that I want to look at uh, today. But I believe that there's no accident in how Jesus taught his disciples that day on the Sermon on the Mount. There's no accident that he started with uh, murder. Referring to that law. Really talking about anger. And how we must all kill any anger that lives with side of us that that builds up with inside of us and and then I believe there's no accident in God's sovereignty as Jesus teaches this to his disciples that he moves from uh, uh, murder to adultery and talks about the lust of the flesh and and then in order we find divorce this law of divorce uh, I believe there's no accident in the sovereignty of God as Jesus is communicating to these disciples what a what a time to examine our hearts, the challenge from the text last week is to check your heart. Lord, is there any wicked way within me? Is, does the anger, is anger living within me? Is lust of the flesh living within me? Is there anything evil way living within me that's not honoring to you? And then I also believe that there's no accident that we come to this important law, four, five, and six, and there's a beautiful order and a call for you and I as the church to be like Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to encourage you to write that down, that, that I believe that this is, this is what is missing in the American church, that we got a lot of people coming to buildings, but we don't have a whole lot of people living like Jesus. And there's a call for those that have called upon the one and only name, King Jesus, to live a life that honors him. That the world might know you and I belong to him, not just because we even say it, but more importantly, because we live it. And so be, be like Jesus. Look at this important law, verse 33. He's referring to swearing. Now, this isn't cussing. He's not referring to, to cussing. He's referring to oath taking. And the law that he is referring to is found in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 12, in case you're curious. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 23. Look to verse 33, Matthew 5. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors. He starts each of these, each six of these, by the way, with, with the same thing. 
referring back to the Old Testament law. You must not break your oath, but you must keep your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, but I tell you, Jesus tells you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne or by earth because it is his foot, footstool or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. So what is Jesus saying? The religious leaders of this day, context is always important. We're going to talk a lot about context this morning. But the religious leaders of, of this day used all kinds of tricks to work around the truth. They wanted the truth to work for them when they wanted it to work for them. But apart from that, they were deceitful. Sadly, sadly, not much has changed over the years. There's men in position that are still trying to use the truth to work for themselves, only for themselves. And it's a sad state when there's a, a lack of accountability. We, we, we need more accountability in the local church, more encouragement in the local church. I, I hope in, that you pray for your pastors and, and, and encourage them and you pray for their, their families and, and you pray that their heart would, would stay close to the Lord Jesus and, and that we would study the scriptures and know the scriptures and live the scriptures and lead you to do the same. But in this, in this time, religious leaders, they, they used all these tricks to work around the truth. And they even made oaths around them. That's why Jesus says, don't take an oath either by heaven, verse 35, by earth, later on by Jerusalem, verse 36, by your head. Do you see it? That's why Jesus said this. Because the religious leaders of this day were taking oaths by all of these things. Whatever sounded good in the moment, they were trying to convince people. So Jesus taught that our conversations, listen church, Jesus taught that our conversations should be so honest and our character so true that we shouldn't need to swear or make oaths for people to believe us. We're living in kind of a society where uh, it's almost as if words have become devalued. And, and I thought a lot about this this week as I was studying this passage because I, I catch myself even trying to say something uh, to preface what I'm about to say. And it's like, why do I even need to say that? <laughs> I, what I'm saying is true. Why do I need to say honestly or, 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 or seriously, or I'm going to tell you the truth. Like, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. I, I there was great conviction in my life. Like I'm trying to convince somebody to believe what I'm saying, even though what I believe is the truth, <laughs> but I'm adding to it. I'm almost devaluing my, my words. Don't devalue your words. Just speak the truth. Just speak the truth. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Would you write that reference down? Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but faithful people are his delight. Lying lips are detestable to the Lord. And so what's coming out of your mouth? Is it truth or is it lies? But, but, but do you see? Faithful people are, are his delight. See, people should believe our words because we are truthful people. If we're really going to talk about being the church and being like Jesus, then people should believe what we're saying to be true because we're truthful people. And if people can't believe what you're saying or they're always guessing what you're saying or wondering, are they lying to me right now? Well, then there's a problem. <laughs> Pause and consider, Lord, where's that coming from? Why do I feel the need to lie? Or, and we're living in such a time where it's like white lies are acceptable. No, white lies are not acceptable. Stop teaching your children to, to, to white lie about it. Tell the truth. Own up to the truth and allow the consequences, whatever they might be, let them, let them, let them come. Parents in particular, your children are listening. They're listening when you're on the phone and you're telling somebody you're like there and you're not there, you know, or I'm coming and it's like, you ain't had to left the house. You ain't put clothes on. Oh, but it's just, it's just, it's okay. No, it's not. Jesus says, let your yes be yes. 
you know, uh, be, 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 no. I, I heard this, the more words a man uses to convince us, the more suspicious we should be. The, the more words a man uses to convince us, the more suspicious we should be. Uh, anyone ever try to buy anything from any salesman? They're talking round and round and round. They're using all this kind of language and all these formulas and, and all these, you know, even bigger words that you might not know. I don't know. And, uh, and then at the bottom of it, they're just trying to wear you out. So you just say, hey, take my money. Take it all. Here's my card. <laughs> you know, take it all. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says, for uh, when, when there are, are many words, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. But the one who controls his lips is prudent. The one who controls his lips is prudent. I wonder, are you able to control your tongue? Proverbs says there is life and death in the tongue. By the way, if you're looking for a reading plan for May, we are reading through Proverbs as a church. We, we are encouraging the church to read one chapter each day through May. And there are printed copies of the reading plan in the back. If you're online, there's a link in the comment section there. Uh, if you're in the house and you'd rather follow along digital, you can scan the QR code in front of you and read with us. Let's increase our, our wisdom. If we're really going to be the church that Jesus is calling us to be, we need his, we desperately need his wisdom. Jesus closes this section by saying, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. And what an encouragement for the church that whenever we commit to something, whatever it may be, our yes is yes and our no is no. We, we see this all the time. Over 15 years, there's been a whole lot of people sign up for something and, and then not show up for something. Right, Pastor Mike, and uh, one of our greatest frustrations, if you will, and in, 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 in our greatest times of prayer is for people to commit in a non-committal society, the church would be different. And that whatever we say yes to, we, we've given our word and we'll keep it. I share with the 9 a.m. crowd, you know, kind of a joke on the side, but since Pastor Mike's in the house, family pastor here, uh, you know, it's, it's always funny that People don't really know what they're signing up for for kids ministry, but we praise God when they sign up for kids ministry. And you as the parents praise God, especially when you're in here trying to receive a word from the Lord and your kid's not every second asking you some question or pulling on you or it's not, no, I don't know, whatever. We, we praise God for uh, our kids leaders. Amen. And uh, we praise God for them. We praise God for them. And by the way, there are openings. If you're looking to serve faithfully, uh, doesn't that, wasn't that a good, good like call? See, I, I'm not the salesman. Uh, I'm not a salesman. I'm just asking you to be like Jesus, amen, and let the Holy Spirit convict where conviction is needed. But uh, let your yes be yes or your no be no. And so on the other side of it, if God has not called you to kids ministry, don't you dare. Don't you dare sign up for that. Now, there's plenty of other ministries. There's no outs, by the way. If you're like, no, I'm good with the seat. No, no, that's not the call to the Christian life. There's more than just the seat. Trust me, there's more than just the seat. Really living like Jesus is getting our hands and feet moving and dirty for the sake of the gospel. Amen. And so uh, I would just encourage you, let your yes be yes, as Jesus says, and your no be no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay, next, next important law that Jesus refers to is retaliation. Now, if you weren't excited about the last one, uh, buckle up. You're probably not going to be excited about this one, but it's the Bible. So, you know, get with Jesus right now. And so Jesus refers to another Old Testament law, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 19, Leviticus chapter four, uh, 24, verse 19. And it's this, it's this re retaliation. Look at verse 38. Look at verse 38, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil doer. Don't resist an evil doer. What? Yeah, I mean, we get, man, we're amped up about the first part, right? We want, we want to go back to that law sometimes, you know? Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, man. Get what's coming to him. But Jesus flips the script. Look at verse 39. Don't resist an evil doer. What? On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. I'm not down for that, Jesus. No. Nope. Verse 40, as for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. 
Verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. The original law, this original law kept people from forcing the offender to pay a greater price than the offense deserved. And Jesus replaced the law with an attitude. And this was the attitude. Be willing to suffer loss yourself rather than cause another to suffer. Ooh, I don't want that though. No, I want them to suffer. I want them to, I want them to feel the pain. I know some of y'all thought that and you said it because <laughs> I've been there. And the application that Jesus is referring to, by the way, is in this context, personal insult, not, a, not to groups or to nations. In order to turn the other cheek, there is a strong encouragement to stay where we are and not run away. Oftentimes when we're faced with those hard moments of life, we want to run. Our instinct is to run. It's to run. But Jesus says, stay and turn. And what does this require from you and I as followers of Jesus? I'll tell you, it requires love and faith and sacrifice. That's what it requires in order to stay when we want to run. And so we will be hurt in doing so. We will be hurt in doing so. It, it also means this, that we should try to help the sinner. We should try to help the sinner. Even as, even as vulnerable people, we're all vulnerable people. We're all vulnerable people, but, but listen today, here's the truth. Even in our vulnerability, we are a victorious people because of Christ Jesus. How are we able to stand even when someone has, has offended us or hurt us? Well, we're only able to stand in Christ Jesus. That's why all things are possible in Christ Jesus. We desperately need his power in us to stand firm when we want to run away. And so look back to this. Jesus says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the other. When one wants to sue you, take, your, take away your shirt, let him have your coat. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Jesus here is referring to a Roman law. Uh, Romans ruled the world at, at this time. And the Roman law allowed any Roman soldier to stop a Jewish person, a Jewish man specifically, on the road and instruct him to drop what he was carrying to assist the Roman soldier with his load. Or the soldier could have simply made the Jew carry his load out of laziness or power trip. And you hear that and you think, well, that's not right. That's not fair. But that was the law at this time. That was the law at this time. And so knowing this, those listening to Jesus that day and for his instructions, Jesus tells them, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. The law only required the Israelite to walk one mile, not two. And so Jesus teaches to go beyond the obligation. To go beyond the obligation, go beyond the fulfillment of this current Roman law. It's interesting when you consider that Jesus just talked about commitment and being truthful people, people of character, letting your yes be yes and your no be no. And then he comes to, to this, how we, how we handle the people in our lives and 
the situations in our lives. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two. So Jesus teaches. Once again, Jesus teaches. And for the disciples, those who follow him, to go beyond the obligation. See, uh, anyone can commit to something. Uh, and oftentimes what we hear and see is, I will commit to to, to this, and now hold on, knowing what we just said about yes, yes, and no, no. But oftentimes, here's what the response is as we consider the heart. Is I will commit to the minimum obligation, but I better receive the maximum blessings of God. And, and, and so Jesus just cuts right to the heart of it, if you will. And he says, don't just fulfill the minimum obligations. You go the distance. Why? Why, why is that that's so important? Because the second mile is not an obligation. Listen, church. The second mile is an opportunity. It's not just out of obligation, but it's an opportunity. And here's the tragedy. Uh, we, we quit too quickly. We, 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 we quit too, too quickly. We want to get by with the absolute minimum, but yet we want the absolute maximum blessings of God to, to flow into our lives. And uh, we bail out quickly after our obligation is completed. And, and the second mile in our lives and this context makes the Roman world look at these disciples of Jesus and say, what is it about them that they're going beyond the first one? And, and, and you and I, as we serve people well for the glory of God and we go beyond the obligation and, and we go that second mile, what it does is it, is, is it allows the, the watching world, the lost world, Look at us and say, what is so different about them? What is it? What is it? And our only response and the only proper response, it is Jesus and Jesus alone as to why I go that second mile. It's Jesus in me. See, the second mile opens up these Gospel conversations that the, the first mile would never happen. A psychologist suggests that uh, violence is born of weakness. H hear me today. Not strength. That violence is born of weakness, not strength. It's the strong who can love it's the strong who can suffer hurt. It's the, it's the strong who can help heal. The weak thinks only of himself. And the weak hurts in order to protect himself. And so what does Jesus say here? He says, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on, on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Go with him too. It flips the script of what we really think about being a strong man or strong woman really looks like. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 says, if your enemy is hungry, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will help uh, heap burning coals on his, on his head and the Lord will reward you. When I, when I read this passage, I don't know, you know whether to get excited or not about that heaping coals on, on the enemy part, you know, because at the first time I'm like, I don't really want, I don't really want to bless this guy, you know, that, that has hurt me. Uh, but Jesus tells me to, so I'm going to do it. But then it's kind of exciting on the other side to let Jesus do what he's going to do with that person. And that's the beauty of walking with Jesus and being led by the spirit of God and growing in Christ Jesus is, is you just be obedient to what God has called you to and leave all the results to him. You just be faithful. You just be like Jesus. 
Look at this, this last, look at this last verse 43. Uh, hate, hate your enemies, hate your enemies. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 is the law that, that he's referencing. Hate your enemies, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Don't even the scum of the earth, Jesus, don't even the scum of the earth do the same? I mean, they can do that. He says, verse 47, what if you greet only your brothers and sisters? What are you doing out of the ordinary? (laughs) Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is, is, is perfect. We see this sixth law that Jesus refers to. And, uh, and we see love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, in the context of the Old Testament before Jesus, in the Old Testament, with the Old Testament law, they, they were called to be separated from uh, the pagan world. They generally looked upon all the uncircumcised as not their neighbors, but rather their enemies. And so... Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus reminds us that our neighbors, even our our, uh, our enemies, reminds that all people are our neighbors and all people, even our, our enemies, And to truly fulfill this law, we must love. We must love. In order to truly fulfill this law, we must bless. In order to truly fulfill this law, we must must do good. And in order to truly fulfill this law, we must pray. Pray for our enemies, not only our friends. It's easy to love people that love you. Amen? I mean, it's it's easy. Especially, you know, the people that it's just like, man, they're so easy to talk to. You know, it's like, well, more of them. But it's the, it's, it's, it's the others that have harmed you, that have hurt you. How do I love them? Jesus tells us to, to pray for them. And the tragedy is to not live out Jesus' words and live the rest of your life holding on to pain that you can release today. All of us have people in our lives that have hurt us, that have mistreated us, that have stolen from us, that have said things that are not kind, started rumors, and all sorts of other kind of sins against us. There's not one person that's like exempt, okay? Just so we're on the same page. Your life isn't that together, I promise. I love you though. Um, But because of the brokenness of this world, we all experience that. And so what do we do with it? Jesus tells us right here, release it. Release the person. Release that situation. Find healing in, in the Lord. Pray for them. Pray for them. Notice in how, how he concludes all of this, by the way. I mean, he's just, I mean, he's just like mic drop like crazy here. These, these six important laws that all of those listening that day would have known. And before Jesus, they were trying their very best to live them out. In addition to these six, 613 total laws that the Jewish people had to uphold. Talked about that a few weeks ago. But then listen to what Jesus says, verse 48, at the very end of all of this. Listen to what he says. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, 
Jesus says, be perfect. Be perfect. The goal is perfection. That's the goal. If we're going to be like Jesus, he was perfect in every way. And so the goal is perfection. And it is impossible in this life. But listen, we should strive for it. We should strive for it. Be perfect suggests completeness and maturity. going to be like Jesus. We should strive for Christ likeness. To be like him. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Paul's writing to the church in, in Philippi and listen this is what he says. He says church listen I know you're going to be under great persecution. I know, I know, I know there's, there's people that don't like what you believe. He says this, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Verse six, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity and when he had come as a man he humbled do you hear that? he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even the death on a cross Jesus loved you and loved me loved this world so much that he came and he walked this earth faced persecution he endured through it all because he knew the end goal and it was sacrifice. What we just did together, taking of the bread and taking of the juice reminds us of his great sacrifice. We're able to pause and reflect on what he did for us and and if we're going to be like Jesus, It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take obedience. And if we could sum all of it up, all six up that are in front of us in chapter five, it would be summed up just like this. You should never hate, slander, or speak evil of another person. If we could hear Jesus today, if there's any anger living within you, remove it. Don't allow it to live and grow. You should never lust in your heart or mind, nor should you covet anything. We're going to strive to be like Jesus. Listen, you should never make a false oath and always be completely truthful. Let your yes be yes and your no. No. You should let God defend you, even when everything inside of you is just running wild. <laughs> let God defend you. You stay the course and you go that extra mile. And you should always love your neighbors and your enemies. Pray for them. bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place in the house online I know this is not an easy message for most of us because even as we look through the scriptures there are people that come that come to your mind and your come to your attention and there are situations that uh, overwhelming right here right now for the next few moments I want to I want to challenge you what is it that's weighing you down 
What is it that's holding you back? Is there any pain that inside of you that maybe you're trying to fix on your own, but what you really need is the healer. You need the healer. You need almighty God. What thing is keeping you up at night? here right now, you would just say, Lord, have it all. Have it all. Have it all. Across this place, would you just say, Lord, would you reveal to me if there's any way within me that's not honoring to you? Would you reveal that right now to me? Help me to surrender it to you. Replace any wicked way within me with things of you, the fruit of your spirit, that a watching world might see that I belong to you, that I might live for you. As you're praying that, if there's one here today whether in the house or online, that's never surrendered over to Jesus for salvation. You know, today can be the day of salvation. And so I wonder if there's someone here that the Spirit of God is moving in your heart saying, surrender over to me. Seek me. Call on me starts with acknowledging that you're a sinner and that he is the Savior. And so if that's you, would you do that right where you're at? Lord, I am a sinner and you are the Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe in you. You came to this earth. You died on a cross and you were placed in a grave and you rose victorious from the grave for me, for the world. And so today I accept you as Savior. I want to live my life for you, for your glory. Thank you for saving me. We're going to sing. And as we sing this song, there's going to be men and women. If you're in the house, there's going to be men and women up front that would love to pray with you. If you're online, there's a host that would love to pray with you. We want to come alongside of you. Whatever it is, whatever the need might be. Would you stand as we sing today, as we respond to the Lord today, whatever it is that you're processing, whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever person, whatever situation, whatever it is, would you surrender it over to the Lord? There's some men and some women at each corner. I would invite you men to pray with men, women to pray with women. Know that you're not alone. We are discovering. I want to stand with you. Take courage. Take that next step. Release it. Move forward.